Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We're going to be in John chapter 3 today, so would you turn in your Bible to John chapter 3 and we're going to talk about being born again by the Spirit. Born again by the Spirit. Does anyone remember the day they were born? Probably not. You've seen pictures, but you probably can't remember the time you opened up your eyes for the first time and started crying. I think that's the grace of God that we didn't have to go through that traumatizing experience and remember it. I remember when my son was born, they transferred him from one table to the next, and I didn't know what to call this scale and light, but it kind of looked like one of those things where you keep food warm, you know, in a restaurant, like a heat lamp. But my son's under this thing, and he's looking around. <laughs> That's such a funny way of explaining it, but I don't know the technical term for the table they put him on, but he's looking around, and he, after he cried for a little bit, he's just amazed at what he's seeing, you know, even though he doesn't see very far, and he's hearing our voice, and he's just intrigued by the atmosphere, and I thought, wow, like this kid just was placed in this world out of nowhere, he's helpless, and he has no idea what's going on. We have to be born into this world to be here and exist. That is the beginning of our existence, but did you know you have to be born into the kingdom of God to have a heavenly kingdom existence? And this is what Jesus talks about in John 3 that we don't have eternal life or we don't have the kingdom of God unless we are born into the kingdom of God. How do we have a relationship with our creator who is spiritual? How do we even connect with him when we don't see him? Today, we're gonna to look at the work of the Holy Spirit at salvation. Jesus usually gets the front and center attention uh, but meanwhile, behind the scenes, the Holy Spirit is doing some mighty work, some powerful things to transfer you into his kingdom. And the Holy Spirit is working powerfully to accomplish this miraculous work in our lives where we are no longer uh, of this world, but now we are of the kingdom of God and inherit eternal life. This does not happen at salvation without the Holy Spirit's work. That's why this is so important that we learn this today, moving forward in our series. So John chapter 3, and we're going to be in verse 1. And it says, there was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. What does Jesus say next? It's almost like he just, in a sense, changes the subject. And he goes, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Hear that today, church, and everyone watching online. Let me say it again. I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus, and that's what I ask myself. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say, you must be born again. What does he mean, by the way, by water and the spirit? There are a lot of perspectives and interpretations on this text. I've read almost, I think I believe I read six this week. And we should not get hung up on what the water word means as much because the main point is you cannot be born again without the spirit. But the word water here, there's two interpretations I prefer the most. And Jesus was referring to repentance as in the baptism uh, of John and, be, and repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus and therefore the Holy Spirit will wash you and make you a new person and you'll be born again. 
Or there's the other um, perspective in text that's popular is that the word water is another word for spirit. So it was as if the writer or as if Jesus was saying uh, water or the spirit, meaning he was talking about the Holy Spirit washing you. And I tend to lean more towards that one. But either way, Jesus, he tells us to repent, right? To turn from our wicked ways and believe in him and you shall be saved. So either one works, but what's important is moving on in the text, it is, the topic is the Holy Spirit, not water. I love verse six, humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. We do not have spiritual life without the Holy Spirit. That's how vital he is in the process of salvation. Now, there's a lot of words used uh, in the Bible and a lot of places in Scripture that talk about salvation, and this is Jesus' way of bringing up salvation, is that you have physical life, but do you have spiritual life? And now, where would, where would this be found in Scripture? How would Nicodemus understand this? And does he talk about the Spirit washing and cleansing someone on the inside somewhere else? Yes, We're going to look at Ezekiel 36. This is in the Old Testament. This is before Jesus was here on earth. And Ezekiel 36, verse 25, it'll be on the screen as well. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away, and you will no longer worship idols. Who who is this, this prophet speaking to? Who is God speaking to? Israel. They were in sin. They were unable to obey. They were wicked. And they were having a hard time following God's decrees. And he says, this is going to come in the future. Verse 26, and I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart. And give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit, capital S, in you the Holy Spirit, so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. In other words, you're having a hard time now? Well, one day, my people are gonna have the Holy Spirit to help them follow my decrees and obey me. We can't obey God without the Holy Spirit. I'll get to a story about that later. But what about in the New Testament? This would be after Nicodemus. Titus chapter 3, 5 through 7 is a common cross-reference for Jesus' conversation uh, with Nicodemus. In Titus chapter 3, also on the screen, says, When God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, It wasn't because you did some good things that you have now qualified to be saved, but because of his mercy. We learned a lot about that in the book of Jonah. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life. How did he do it? Through the Holy Spirit. It wasn't through water baptism. Water baptism is a symbol of of what took place spiritually in us, it's through the Holy Spirit that your sins are washed away when you believe in Jesus Christ. Today, we're gonna celebrate nine to 10 people are giving their life to Christ, they've given their life, and now they're gonna get water baptized to confess it publicly that they're following Jesus and that they're a new person in Christ. And it's awesome. And we're gonna do these more often. We're not gonna wait for every four months to do water baptisms. So we have a nice little gathering at the end of this service to, uh, to baptize these 10 people, and we're excited about that. They've made a decision. Let's give them a hand. If you're not going to be here, let's give them a hand. We praise God for that. Praise the Lord. It goes on in verse 6. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, because of what Jesus did, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. There you have it. You can enter the kingdom of God because of the salvation of Christ and the washing of the Holy Spirit. The word that theologians use for this concept in scripture is called regeneration. 
to regenerate someone who is spiritually dead. R.A. Torrey defines regeneration as this, the impartation of life, the giving of life, spiritual life, to those who are spiritually dead. The impartation of a new nature, God's own nature indwelling us when we are born again. I love this definition as well. Regeneration greatly empowers individuals to live for God rather than self. Regeneration causes a person to genuinely want to live for God and to consistently behave in ways that demonstrate this desire. How do you know you're truly saved? How do you know that you've been washed by the, by the blood of the Lamb and the Holy Spirit in your life? How do you know you've had true conversion? Right here. All of a sudden, you don't want to live for yourself. You want to live for God. Regeneration. It's the Spirit coming into you, giving you life because you're spiritually dead. We don't have that unless the Holy Spirit has come, and he did, and then we receive the Spirit when we believe in Christ at the same time. I love what R.A. Torrey also says on the doctrine of regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. He says, it sweeps away false hopes. What does he mean by that? It comes to the one who is trusting in education and culture and says, education and culture are not enough. You must be born again. There's not enough knowledge. There's not enough that you can try to change yourself to, to receive the Holy Spirit in your life. It comes to the one who's trusting in mere external morality, living a good life, so to say. External morality is not enough. You must be born again. None of our good deeds will ever measure up enough to help us be saved. Because you know why? We'll just continue to do bad things too. We need the forgiveness and grace of God who helps us be right with God in his sight. We need the Holy Spirit to do that. It comes to the one who's trusting in the externalities. So ready for this, just buckle in for a second. Let's finish what he's saying here before you go, wait a second, that's impossible. It comes to the one who's trusting in the externalities of religion. In other words, in going to church, reading the Bible. Did you know that unsaved people can read the Bible? They can. Saying prayers. You know unsaved people can, can say prayers. Being confirmed or baptized. Partaking of the Lord's Supper. We shouldn't take the Lord's Supper if we're not a believer in Christ. We can go through the motions, is what R.A. Torrey is saying, but unless we're born again, we will not see the kingdom of God. What is he trying to say here? You can't be religious. You must have faith in Christ to be saved. You can have perfect church attendance, and as a pastor, I appreciate that. You can serve, you can give, you can get water baptized, but if there hasn't been a transformation, a trust in Christ in here, then you are not ready for the kingdom of God. This is Nicodemus. Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, you're not ready. You're not ready. He goes on to say this. It comes to the one who is trusting. Regeneration comes to the one who's trusting and turning over a new leaf. Outward reform or changing their rebellion. And it says this, outward reform and quitting your rebellion is not enough. You must be born again. Well, that's fascinating. If I stop sinning, then I'll be saved. No. If I do good deeds, I'll be saved. No. You must trust in the work of Christ, not your work. Or lack thereof bad things. What is that? That's that's dressing up a corpse and hoping that it starts walking around again without the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody said this, people will say, if that is to have a new birth, what am I to do? I can't create life. I certainly can't save myself. And D.L. Moody says, you certainly can't. And we don't preach that you can we tell you it is utterly impossible to make a person better without Christ. And that is what men are trying to do. 
They are trying to patch up this old Adam's nature or sinful nature. There must be a new creation instead. Regeneration or the Holy Spirit coming in and waking you to life, making you alive in Christ, Ephesians 2 talks about that, is a new creation. And if it is a new creation, it's a work of God. It's God working in you, not you. So only God can give us new life, and it is done through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when you believe in Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. Church, when you give your life to Christ, to God, your old self is gone. You're in a new creation. You're a new person in his eyes. That's something to celebrate. I don't think we think of it that way. I don't think we think of our existence that way. We don't see how God sees us. By the way, Pastor Kuhn did a series, 22-week plus series on God's view of you back in the day when I was a kid. I know this because I had to organize all the tapes. God views you as a new creation. Do you view yourself as a new creation? Because a new creation behaves and thinks and does things differently. The Holy Spirit has the power to make you a new creation. We're going to get into next week why we don't stop then sinning completely. We're going to get into that next week on the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit and how he cleanses us and works with us. But just know this, that God sees you as forgiven and innocent, justified. When we recognize that we are, then we'll live differently. But we must believe that that has happened through the washing of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus illustrates the Spirit working in us for salvation by using the analogy of wind. Because you may not see the Holy Spirit come into you at all. You don't, right? No one has. You don't see this tangible ghost-looking thing come into you because he's not like that. His spirit enters upon into you and dwells in you at salvation when you believe. And the wind, you don't know where it comes from or where it's going, but you see the effects of it. The Holy Spirit produces a new life in you. You'll see a change in your heart, the way you think, what you feel, your passion for holiness and serving God and serving others, love for other people that you didn't think you could love. This is what the Holy Spirit does. So we see the effects of the Holy Spirit, but we don't necessarily see him come in when we believe. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith. But what's interesting about being born again is if you're born physically, you're a child of someone, right? Well, the Bible talks about this transfer into the kingdom of God as you are a child of God. When you look up any scripture about being born again, it always takes you to how God identifies you as one of his children. Hey, you've been born into my kingdom? Guess what? You are one of my children, and I love you, and I am your father. Now, guess how that happens? It's also a work of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we do not have the affirmation or confirmation that we are children of God. Well, let me show you where it says that in Scripture. John chapter 1, 10 through 13 will also be on the screen. John chapter 1, just a few pages over. He came into this very world he created. He's talking about Jesus. But the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people. He's talking about Israel, the Jews, the Hebrews. And even they rejected him. But to all who believed him, And accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. You are a child of God. In case you needed more evidence of that, Ephesians chapter 1, 12 through 14, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles, and that can mean anyone who's not a Jew, anyone like us, if you're not a Jew, and you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. 
The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He has bought you. He ransomed you from sin. He paid that ransom that you were trapped in. And he adopts you as a child of God. He did this so that we could praise and glorify him. When we praise and glorify God, it brings glory to God. It brings fame. And, and people start to notice our testimonies. And they notice that God is obviously working in our lives. Romans 8. How about one more text? And we'll be in Romans 8 next week as well. Romans 8, 15 through 17. You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. Some interpretations say that is like your heavenly father or dad, your dad. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Well, that's encouraging because the day of judgment, you want to make sure, hey God, I'm one of your children. You know me, right? Yes, I know you. You're one of my children. And the reason why he'll know is because his spirit will be in you. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. In other words, we are co-heirs with Christ. We inherit whatever Jesus inherits. We are like his siblings, so to say. You know, we're his younger brothers and sisters. He was the firstborn of many, according to Romans 8, 29, later on in this chapter. You are children of God, and our big brother is Jesus. And guess what? We get to inherit what God has given him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And by the way, he was the best example of how to live for God. So we follow our big brother's example, really our Savior, Jesus. But just a fair warning, Paul doesn't end it like that. He says this, but if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. When we choose to believe in Christ, we choose to deny ourselves and follow Jesus, right? And Jesus was perfect and was so good. And he was also honest. And people didn't like his honesty. And because of that, they crucified him. And that's why he said, take up your cross and follow me. Be willing to suffer as I suffer. So I just want to give you a heads up. If you're looking for just peace and um, no, no suffering and only joy and happiness the rest of your life here on earth, that isn't promised. And if any preacher is saying that, they're wrong. And just so you know, there is peace, though, through the suffering through Jesus Christ. In other words, we will be peacemakers, peacekeepers, and we will feel peace even though we're going through tough times because Jesus himself is peace and he lives in us. That's just the Bible. So there's no false promises there from Jesus. Actually, Jesus was so honest, giving us a heads up like that. If you ever felt like an orphan, you're not, you're adopted. And if you are literally an orphan, just so you know, there's a, there's a God in heaven. He's your father. He loves you so much. And what's amazing about adoption in scripture is we inherit all the same blessings as his original children, the Jews. So everything that was promised to the Jews, the Gentiles are promised that as well. And it's as if we've always been God's child from the beginning. You get the same blessings as his own son. Wow, that's amazing. But only if you're born again into the kingdom of God. Without that, you do not receive that. And I want to note something because there's some false teaching out there. And I was hanging out with friends last night who came from this. And it was so good to hear their journey out of it. And there is a teaching out there that, because here's the question. When do you receive the Holy Spirit? 
Do you receive the Holy Spirit when you're baptized in the Spirit and pray in tongues or in the Spirit? Or do you receive him when you believe in Jesus Christ and what he's done for you? It's the latter. When we believe in Jesus Christ, I just read to you three scriptures. When you believe in Jesus Christ, he gives you his Holy Spirit right away to identify you as a child of God. We call that the indwelling Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is that infilling power, more power from the Holy Spirit to do ministry and to minister to the body of Christ and also to do signs and wonders out in the world. There is a difference. And just so you know, that means that you don't have to pray in tongues to be saved. That is a false teaching. The initial evidence of being baptized in the Spirit is you'll begin to pray in the Spirit and pray in a heavenly language we call tongues. And that is, and I can't wait to get to that because I want to try to take out all the scary stuff of that and all the things that people have said about us that like we're demon possessed or something when we do that. It's not true. To be honest with you, that's blasphemy to call the Holy Spirit that. But what I don't like is the false teaching that someone feels inadequate and like they're not saved because they haven't been, haven't prayed in tongues yet. That's not anywhere in the gospel as a requirement for being saved. So when does the Holy Spirit come into you? As soon as you believe, like the wind, you don't see it, but you'll see the effects in your life. The indwelling is different than the infilling. And the infilling was for the apostles in the church and us as the church to walk in power and then demonstrate the works of God for all those who would see it. That's it. So if anyone has felt like you're not saved because you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, that's not true. You are saved when you believe in Christ and what he's done for you. You have the Spirit in you already. I mean, I mean, before I got baptized in the Spirit, God was speaking to me, working to me, convicting me. That I wasn't baptized in the Spirit when I was told to give money to the, to the kids' church, and I could tell that God was speaking to me through his Spirit in my house. So just, just want you guys to be aware of that. Let's go back to John 3. Because you can't leave out this famous portion of scripture, this conversation that Jesus continues to have. And the question I want to answer is, how are we born again then? And I know I've already said it multiple times. How are we regenerated and become children of God? Jesus says it in John 3, 9 through 17. Now Nicodemus is still a little confused. He says, how are these things possible? And if you think about it, how, how do you explain this, you know? To, to in a, from a, a spiritual world, the kingdom. By the way, Jesus always taught in parables that help explain kingdom principles. And he taught in this language. He was trying to explain heavily things to a physical thinker. And so he's trying to help. And so he goes on to say this. You are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. What is he talking about here with this, this bronze snake on a pole? In Numbers 21, the Israelites had sinned so bad, their, their punishment to get their attention, to change their ways, was they were bitten by venomous snakes. And so God instructs Moses, please, please for them, mercy on them. And God instructs Moses to, to make a, a bronze snake, put it on a pole, and lift it up. And anyone who looks to it would be healed, and they wouldn't die. This was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ being lifted on the cross and anyone who look and believe him will be healed spiritually and they would be saved and forgiven other sins and have everlasting life. He's talking to Nicodemus who would know this story. Jesus is masterfully sharing the gospel with a bright man, very well-educated man. He's saying, you know what he's saying here? Well, let me, let me finish the last two verses real quick and then I'll tell you. Hang on. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So there is belief. 
God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. We're talking about a man who has lived his life doing things to be accepted and be righteous. And Jesus is saying, it's not what you do, it's who you believe in. Let me share what one commentator says. He says, as a devout Orthodox Jew, he presumed that his place in the coming kingdom was assured. This is Nicodemus. Surely I get to inherit the kingdom because I am a Jew. By virtue of his race and circumcision, surely the coming kingdom is his. Besides that, he was a leading religious professional and moreover a Pharisee and member of the ruling council. There could be few Jews, if any, in the entire city that night whose credentials were more impressive as far as acceptance with God was concerned. So in other words, like if anyone should be in the kingdom of God, it's Nicodemus. He's done everything right but he hasn't done one thing. Believe in Jesus, the one standing right in front of him. It's when you do that, that spiritually you are born again and you put your faith in that transaction from death to life, from darkness to light, however the scriptures want to explain it. Now, do you know what happens if we miss out on the kingdom of God? Let me read to you what I couldn't write this better, so I'm just going to read what he said. Now, I want you to think about the kingdom of God and what is in store for everyone who believes in Jesus. And this is what we miss if we're not born again. Let me get a sip of water real quick. This is a pretty lengthy paragraph. D.L. Moody said this, We may travel through the earth and see many countries and kingdoms, but there is one we shall never see unless we're born again. We look abroad and see many beautiful trees, but the tree of life we shall never see until our eyes are made clear by faith in the Savior. You may see the beautiful rivers of the earth, like the Ohio, the Mississippi, the Hudson. You may ride upon their bosoms, but bear in mind that your eye will never rest upon the river which bursts out from the throne of God and flows through the upper kingdom. You will never see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You may see the kings and lords of the earth, but the king of kings and the lord of lords you will never see except you are born again. When you are in London, you may go to the tower and see the crown of England, which is worth millions and is guarded there by soldiers. But bear in mind that your eye will never rest upon the crown of life except you are born again. You may come to these meetings and hear the songs of Zion, which are sung here. He's talking about going to church. But one song that Moses and the Lamb the, the one song of Moses and the Lamb, the uncircumcised ear shall never hear that song unless you are born again. We may see the beautiful mansions of New York and the Hudson, but bear in mind that the mansions which Christ has gone to prepare you shall never see unless you are born again. It is God who says it. You may see 10,000 beautiful things in this world, but the city that Abraham caught sight of, and from that time he became a pilgrim and sojourner, you shall never see unless you're born again. And then this one hits close to home. Many of you may be invited to marriage feasts here, but you will never attend the marriage supper of the Lamb unless you're born again. You may be looking on the face of your sainted mother, your Christian mother, tonight and feel that she is praying for you, but the time will come when you shall never see her again unless you are born again. All of that is for us. We inherit all of that if we're born again. If we don't, we won't see any of it. We won't experience it for ourselves. The Holy Spirit right now is calling you to believe in Jesus Christ so that the Holy Spirit can wash you clean so that you are in the kingdom of God. Let me share two takeaways and I wanna share a story in closing. Overall, what we're learning here is we can't physically achieve what must be spiritually conceived. Only the Holy Spirit can accomplish the miracle of new life in us. You can try as much as you want, but unless you trust in Christ and let the Holy Spirit cleanse you on the inside, you won't enter the kingdom of God. But what's amazing is, is that God graciously poured out his Holy Spirit to make that possible. 
and all are welcome, not just a select few. All are welcome to receive his spirit and be a child of God. And for us as Christians, for us who are making disciples, we need, to, we need to know something. We teach the lost that salvation is not found in outward works, but through faith in the works of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Oh, let us be a church, please, that doesn't try to dress up a corpse spiritually. I love that we come to church. I love that we're reading our Bible and praying. But we need to help that person come to their knees and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Do not leave it up to someone to read the Bible on their own, although the Holy Spirit does it. Praise the Lord. How many of you have been saved because you're in your home reading the Bible to yourself and Jesus spoke to you? But may we also partner with the Holy Spirit, as I said last week, and lead people to confessing him as our Lord and Savior so that the Spirit of God would come in and wash us and give us a new identity in Christ. I'll be brief. I'll try to be brief with this story. I met with a friend many years ago and took him out to lunch. just felt burdened for him and his salvation. And he told me a few things that really concerned me and I was able to speak in his life. He said, Ryan, I know like the textbook that everything I'm doing is wrong. I know. But I don't want to stop doing those things. I mean, he, he literally was very transparent and confessed, I enjoy them. But there are sinful things I won't go into. And then when he did try, he was trying to be good and do the right things and then he thought, maybe then I'll come to God and say, Lord, save me. And I said, bro, my friend, you no. We don't get cleaned up and then God saves us. We come to God dirty and then he cleans us up. And then that, that striving of trying to do good, you're not meant to do that alone. He sends his Holy Spirit to dwell in you, to give you a responsive heart, a heart that would be convicted and and bothered if you do something wrong, but also bothered to do what's right. I said, you need the Spirit of God to come in. I wish I could tell you that that day he, he decided to receive Christ, but he didn't. As we learned last week, we need the Holy Spirit to do his work, don't we? We plant a seed. That's all I said. I didn't preach a five-point sermon or anything like that. It's all we talked about after we caught up. But I, I'm... I'm happy to tell you that I'm seeing him serve God today now. I praise God for that. <laughs> praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit is working in your life today. He's drawing you right now, whether you're online or in this room, to say, trust in me for salvation, not yourself. I forgive you. Let me come into your life and help you live a life for me. Let me empower you to do that. Would you close your eyes and just bow our heads just to, to allow someone to make that decision today. If that's you, by the way, just so you know, there's Bibles in the pews. If you need a Bible, please take one because the Holy Spirit will speak to you as you read the Bible. And we want to know if you pray and ask God to forgive you and to change you and to come into your life because we want to help you with that journey as well. But today, if that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something bold real quick. I'm going to say, you're not going to come down here just right where you are so I know who I'm praying for. Would you raise a hand? You're saying, I am trusting in Christ today, not my works any longer, and I give you my life. Very good. I see hands. Amen. Amen. You can put them down as soon as you raise them up. Praise the Lord. And if you're online, let us know. You can pray from your heart. And here's something you can pray. Lord, I see my need for you. It's not my works, my good deeds, 
or my refrain from bad things. It's what Jesus did for me on the cross. I believe in Jesus. I confess him as my Lord and Savior. Now come into my life through your Holy Spirit and make me a new person. Give me new life. And today I declare I am born again by the power of Jesus Christ and his spirit. Thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray you would be with us as believers. Lord, help us to get this important message out. And Lord, may we not be content. May we keep moving forward, praying for your spirit to move in people's lives. Help us, Lord, to see authentic, genuine transformation. Lead and guide us as we lead others. Thank you, Lord, that we are comforted today, that we are your children, that your spirit affirms that we are children of God, your children. Thank you, God, that we can walk out of this room confident that you love us, that we are yours, and that we inherit all that you have for us in the coming days in your eternal kingdom that we will experience. We thank you for that. We believe it, and we walk in it with confidence and joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God glory and praise for those decisions. God bless you, church. Praise God.